Good afternoon on today's Angry Bulletin. And there goes the rocket. Let's go, guys. Let's go. Oh, no. Holy, oh, my, holy shit. Look at it go. Look at it go. And we're waiting for an incredible amount of noise about to hit. Insane. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Absolutely stunning. All of this and more coming at you on The Angry Astronaut right now. Good afternoon once again. Welcome to The Angry Astronaut. What a stunning experience yesterday. I feel very blessed indeed to have had the opportunity to watch that amazing liftoff starship performing so well at least to start off with, and achieving something that no other launch provider has ever achieved, and that is to launch the most powerful rocket in human history into space, past the Kármán line, something that the Soviets tried several times with N1 and were unable to accomplish. SpaceX was able to pull it off on the second attempt, which is quite an amazing thing, something that definitely should not be understated as so much of the mainstream media is trying to do. What they're emphasizing is, oh, that they launched it, it blew up, it failed again, blah, blah, blah. I don't think anybody really seriously expected that the second launch of Starship was going to result in a successful orbit of the Earth, a splashdown off the coast of Hawaii, obviously. I still didn't think that that was going to be the case. Well, most of me thought that anyway, because I literally put my ass on the line as far as all of that is concerned. All of that having been said, though, SpaceX has a hell of a long ways to go before Starship becomes a practical, mature system capable of delivering human beings to the moon. And as I have said many, many times, I think NASA made a significant error in trying to think that something this complicated, something this ambitious, was going to have the remotest chance of putting humans on the surface of the moon by 2025 or 2026. Given everything that still remains to be accomplished, it's going to be a significant amount of time before Starship can actually carry out a successful Artemis 3 mission. But I don't want to take anything away from what was accomplished yesterday because for the most part it was truly stunning and so much better than the first time around. Also, I want to make sure to emphasize that I'm going to take you through the process of what happened during this launch and what might have transpired, what might have caused both the orbiter and the uh, booster to fail in the long run. But still, we really don't know. I have a feeling SpaceX still doesn't know, at least not exactly what went wrong during the launch. A lot of this is just speculation. And anybody who says otherwise on YouTube or elsewhere, you got to take all of that with a grain of salt, seriously, because this is a complex machine. There's a lot of things that could have gone wrong during this process, and we still, I'm sure, don't know what exactly happened. So, let's take you through the launch. Let's find out what happened with Starship, at least to the best of our knowledge, and what's going to be coming next. So first of all, let's do a comparison between the two launches. The launch in the upper right is OFT-1, and the main view is OFT-2. And there is a slight pause there, which messes up this comparison because X was having difficulties. There was a bit of lag in that feed. But as you can see, OFT-2 managed to get clear of the tower a little bit faster than OFT-1. However, it was a minor difference. Aside 
aside from that, the two launches were fairly similar. However, the similarities kind of fell apart after that, given the fact that OFT-1 was having engine failures left and right, and OFT-2 was having no failures whatsoever. Look at all 33 of those Raptor 2 engines performing perfectly. This was a triumph of the booster's propulsion system. Such a complicated system with 33 engines, the Soviets could never make that work correctly, and SpaceX most definitely did yesterday. And by the way, you're going to see an enormous difference in terms of what the launch pad looked like during the takeoff as well. Let's just give you a little bit of a spoiler here. The launch pad is fine, but again, look at all of those gaps, all of those failed engines at such an early stage in the launch for OFT-1, none of that happening with OFT-2. Quite an amazing difference and a huge step forward in so many respects. And the differences become even more pronounced as the process goes on. We're getting up to the point where OFT-1 started to flip around wildly as it was unable to separate, whereas OFT-2 is still pushing on towards the hot staging process without any difficulties whatsoever. In just a few moments, you're going to see the astonishing difference between the two flights solely because of the separation process because pretty much nothing went right with the separation process with OFT-1. This flight was over. Well, essentially, this flight was over already based on the number of engines that had failed by the time it got to this point. But of course, as we can see, the engines never lit and the rocket is already beginning to flip around out of control. This is actually the stage when the flight termination charges should have gone off, and yet the rocket was clearly not destroyed at this point. The reason I'm pointing out these dramatic differences is this is what the FAA is going to be looking at as well. Here comes the hot stage separation. Wow, what an amazing process. Lighting those engines while the two stages are still connected to give that extra boost, increasing its payload capacity by, at least in theory, 10% or so. The Russians do this on a regular basis. NASA does not. And SpaceX has demonstrated that it can work, although I wouldn't necessarily call this a complete success of hot staging just yet, because in just a moment, you're going to see the booster explode. Now, this was the flight termination system going off, but nonetheless, why did it explode so quickly after the separation process? Now, there are some people on my team, actually, who say that if there was damage during the hot staging process, process, then the explosion should have occurred a lot earlier, that whatever happened to the booster might have been caused by propellant slosh or something along those lines, or a failure of some kind in the propulsion system that led to the flight termination system being activated as they lost control of the booster. Hard to say, but I remain unconvinced. I think that the hot staging process, at least as far as the booster is concerned, had some sort of impact. Firing all of those Raptor engines directly on top of the booster, regardless of whether it had a hot staging ring and whether it was shielded or not, I don't think that provided sufficient protection for the booster. I really have my doubts as to whether or not this process is going to prove prove practical in the long run or whether or not it's going to be worth all the damage to the booster for 10% improvement in payload delivery. However, the orbiter kept going for a considerable amount of time, achieving an altitude way beyond the Kármán line until telemetry was mysteriously lost at an altitude of 148 kilometers. So what is going to be happening next? How does this stack up against the last launch? Does that mean we're going to see another launch a lot sooner? Well, first of all, I would like to thank Wayne Smith and Daniel Reed, two of 16 new members on Patreon this month. I really appreciate your support together with all of the people who made generous donations in the Super Chats and on PayPal. Without your support, well, 
I'd be broke by now, given the expenses of coming out here, the cost of hotel rooms, etc. So thanks very much for making all of this possible. If you'd like to support my future endeavors, well, all the details are in the description. Okay, so first of all, the most important and crucial difference. As near as we can tell, this launch did not destroy the launch pad the way the first one did. The water-cooled plate appears to have done its job. Now, we can't say if any damage was done to the water-cooled plate because it needs to be more thoroughly inspected, and obviously SpaceX isn't really telling us all of the details, but nevertheless, in terms of scattering debris far and wide around the Boca Chica area and into those all-important protected wildlife regions, well, none of that happened this time, and that's going to make a colossal difference. Now, to be very clear, a mishap report has been filed again. The FAA is going to want to know why the booster exploded, why the orbiter didn't make it, oh yeah, and also, very importantly, why the orbiter ended up burning up over the Gulf of Mexico and not somewhere off the coast of Hawaii and spread debris all over the Gulf just north of Puerto Rico. Even though it didn't endanger anybody, the debris didn't come down where it was supposed to. All of those things are going to have to be investigated, but still, this launch went so much better that, in my opinion, we're probably going to see an OFT3 in January or maybe early February. And that's good, because we need another launch as rapidly as possible. Bill Nelson spoke very highly of yesterday's launch, saying the following, quote, Congrats to the teams who made progress on today's flight test. Spaceflight is a bold adventure demanding a can-do spirit and daring innovation. Today's test is an opportunity to learn, then fly again. Together, NASA and SpaceX will return humanity to the moon, Mars, and beyond brave words, very confident words, and yet a ridiculously tall hill to climb in a ridiculously short period of time. Keep in mind, according to the official Artemis schedule, SpaceX is supposed to be putting an unmanned human landing system on the moon in 2024, and they will most probably not reach orbit until early 2024, and it may even be later than that. And as if the pressure on the SpaceX team wasn't serious enough. NASA recently announced that it's going to require at least 15 launches of Starship in order to refuel Lunar Starship sufficiently to carry out the Artemis 3 mission. That probably includes the launch of Lunar Starship itself and the launch of the propellant depot, but the high teens is what they said, as opposed to maybe six launches or eight launches that Elon's been telling us this whole time. NASA is not nearly as optimistic, meaning that we're we're talking about a ship that needs to reach a high degree of rapid reusability. We can't be losing 15, 16 starships just to put two people on the surface of the moon. That is insanely wasteful. More wasteful, I would say, even than SLS. And speaking of SLS, if I had predicted 18 months ago that SLS was going to make it to the moon more than than a year before Starship made it to orbit, I probably would have been strung up. And yet, that is precisely what has happened. It clearly demonstrates that although Starship is a much better rocket for exploring the solar system, 100% reusable as opposed to almost completely expendable, far less costly, far less wasteful, it's just a much better rocket, SLS is a lot more mature. At this moment, the core stage for Artemis 2 is nearly ready to be shipped to Cape Canaveral, and very probably human beings are going to be on their way to the moon before the end of 2024 for a successful orbit of our natural satellite. And also, this capsule, the Orion capsule that is, is going to carry these human beings further away from Earth than humans have ever gone in the past. There are some big accomplishments coming up for SLS in the future, and again, it demonstrates that this rocket still has a very important part to play 
because Starship still has a ways to go before it's going to be capable of putting anything on the lunar surface, let alone human beings. That having been said though, yesterday was a massive step forward. It makes me supremely confident that Starship is ultimately going to be a very successful system. I can't wait to see OFT3. And in the meantime, well, I'll be bringing you all the updates on OFT2, all the details of what SpaceX discovers about this mission, and I'll bring it to you as rapidly as I possibly can. And as you know, I release content very swiftly, so I hope you guys continue to support this channel. Please like, please subscribe. Thanks again very much for watching, and as always, stay angry about space.